Number 10, Richard Nixon. I just want the American people to know that I've never profited off the people. I've earned every cent, and I am not a crook. <laughs> Uh, anyway, said Richard Nixon, who might quite possibly be a crook. He probably was. Nixon was the 37th president of the United States of America and had a lot on his plate. China, the Soviet Union, the Middle East, that little tiny war that no one's worried about ever called the Vietnam War. It was a little tiny one, not a big deal at all, totally not. Oh man, with all that you just might forget to take bribes from the mafia backed teamsters and to do the whole Watergate scandal. Ooh. Look, every president has their secrets and corruption is just part of the plan. After the Watergate scandal on August 9, 1974, Nixon resigned, which was the right thing to do, but if he didn't, well, he was most likely going to be impeached and he most likely was uh, going to be removed from office. It was going to go all the way, so. Number 9, Manuel Noriega. Most Americans will recall a time in the 1980s when Central America was a point of concentration for American agencies. A big juicy piece of American history and a place that saw it all was Panama and its de facto leader, Manuel Noriega. Central America had been a target for the US for some time as communism was beginning to spread down in those gorgeous weather countries, which is a no-no, we don't want that. Manuel himself had been an asset to CIA intelligence for years, and during all the spying on the Reds and overthrowing Contra groups, well, it got a little out of hand. However, Manuel wasn't stupid, and during his time working with the CIA, he had amassed a large fortune, especially after it was discovered he was also aiding those, um, how do you say, white powder smugglers in their efforts. You know what I'm talking about. This would result in an American invasion in Panama and his duly arrest. Number 8, JFK. For the most part, this man was great, a president that is fondly remembered by a lot of people in the US. However, the man was not without controversy. First off, the Kennedy family wealth has its ties to La Cosa Nostra, as JFK Sr. made his fortune bootlegging in the 20s. Hey, you gotta make your money somehow. Add to this that JFK's vote numbers may or may not have been uh, tampered with and, uh, well, it's bad luck for democracy. Starting the Vietnam War, having an affair with his wife and, well, it's also rumored that he may also have more mob connections. Not so much him being the gangster, but uh, more like... Uh, more like along the lines of, hey, we did you a favor kind of thing, don't forget it kind of thing, or somebody could get hurt kind of thing, kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Number seven, Jimmy Hoffa. Have you folks ever been to Las Vegas? Ever wondered how such an amazing city could be built in the desert? A place where there's blackjack and ladies of the evening, as a futuristic robot would say. Honestly, when I go on my first vacation, it's probably going to be Las Vegas. It's just my kind of town. I love that kind of stuff. So does Chris. We like that. We like buffets and blackjack and yeah, ladies. Nice, nice, very nice. Well, back in the 1950s, Las Vegas wasn't a town of corporate-owned family casinos and resorts. Back then, it was all mafia. It's just how it goes. Basically, you get a loan from a corrupt Teamsters union with a VIG, of course, fill it with swanky stuff, book the Hollywood elite like Frank Sinatra or my favorite, Don Rickles, and you got yourself a casino and resort. All of this thanks to Jimmy Hoffa, who was the leader of the Teamsters union who would loan out Teamster cash to known criminals so they could make their fortune in Las Vegas. Which in case you didn't know is fraud and extremely corrupt and very dishonest, especially for a man that claims to be very honest. It wasn't a good look, it was bad. Number six, Yuri Geller. Today this name doesn't mean very much, but back in the day it actually meant quite a lot. Yuri Geller is a self-proclaimed psychic who possesses psychic abilities. During his peak fame had convinced people of his psychic powers, uh, spoiler alert, he doesn't have any. His powers are more along the lines of a birthday party magician. Now, there's nothing wrong with magic or illusions, I actually enjoy them quite a lot. I think it's fun and interesting showmanship. I love magicians, they're cool. However, Yuri doesn't sell it like that, and, and that's the issue really, is that he's selling it. Telling people that they can have his psychic powers too, like psychokinesis and telepathy, all you need to do is buy this book for $49.99. Best value, best value though. Even though he's been debunked and proven wrong on separate occasions, including on television, which is just insane. Seriously, look that guy up, it's crazy. He's been, he's been debunked like five times. Number five, Pablo Escobar. Imagine being born in a poor country, one of the poorest, and after a few short years, being the richest man on the planet. 
at least cash wise. Pablo Escobar was a smuggler from Colombia and during the 1980s rose to absolute fame and infamy. Starting out as smuggling your standard illicit cargo like valuable electronics, goods and, and upgrading to whatever macho man Randy Savage was on during the entirety of his career. You know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah! <laughs> I need someone to know sugar Hulkamania brother. Strangely enough with all his wealth he tried to take his claim and run for office in Colombia which didn't work out because they knew who he was. He can give his money out to the people all he wants but the dude had quite the rap sheet. Probably one of the biggest. Number 4 Al Capone Al Capone is the textbook definition of corrupt and sure he isn't the leader in the normal sense but a lot of people looked up to him. However that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about all the people he made corrupt. Cops, lawyers and even judges. There was a lot. It's kind of alarming actually. All were warming up to him and old Scarface because their pockets were deep and if you didn't take the money well. Well, you, you could end up getting hurt pretty bad actually. Capone may be gone, but Chicago to this day remains one of the most corrupt cities in America. That was actually ranked number one corrupt city in America three times in a row. That's crazy. Illinois being the third most corrupt state, so there you go. Number three, Frank Rosenthal. Okay, back to Las Vegas and the casinos. Frank Rosenthal. He was an American sports betting genius and perhaps maybe had connections to the Las Vegas mob. But I ain't saying nothing. Well, Rosenthal was such a good earner, as I've been told, that he was put in charge of his very own casino. Now, anyone who's ever worked in the casino industry or lottery will tell you that the rules are very strict. There's no fooling around with state law. The counting room, for example, only gives access to certain people. Not even the owner sometimes can go in. Well, under Rosenthal, sometimes a few hundred thousand dollars would go missing from time to time in a skim operation. Casino managers are supposed to be squeaky clean. Rosenthal was anything but. Number two, Joseph Stalin. Today, most young people know the Gulag as the place you go when you really suck at Call of Duty Warzone. And let me tell you, I spent my fair share in there, brother. I spent my fair share in there, brother. <laughs> However, for people living under Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union, this was not. A fun FPS to play with friends. Gulags were awful, wretched Soviet prisons where all the peoples he deemed a threat to greater communism were sent to most likely work themselves into their graves, and they did. Millions of people suffered under his reign, and he's remembered only for his brutality and history's second best mustache. It's a pretty good one. It's more, it's more like Mario's, but anyway. Number one, angry German boy, angry German guy. German, you, you know what I'm talking about. You all know him, you all should hate him, really you should. It's the failed art student turned totalitarian autocrat. Mustache man thought he was bringing home a better Germany, but he was actually dooming it. After his time spent in the First World War, he was tasked by the government to spy on some other groups who were suspected of being evil communists. Wasn't a lot of love for them back then. He ended up finding the National Socialist Party, where he quickly rose to be their leader. And then some brown shirts were made, and then some glass was broken, and then some good folks got hurt, and then your grandpa got uh, just a big mess, big mess. Number 10, Richard Nixon. I am not a crook. <laughs> yes. Famous words from the man who might have possibly been a crook. I'm okay, he was. Richard Nixon, the 37th president of the United States of America. A time in America when a lot of history was unfolding. Seriously, crazy times. Speaking of unfolded, just like the documents regarding the Watergate scandal, after successfully ending the American involvement in the Vietnam War, Shortly after escalating it, Nixon found himself in some hot water. Break ins at the Democratic Committee were not a presidential look. Naturally, he denied all claims of his involvement, and folks believed him. How could they not? He's the president. Not too long after, some tapes would reveal his wrongdoings, and shortly after that, he became the only president to resign office. Number nine, Jimmy Hoffa. James Riddle Hoffa. If you haven't seen the movie The Irishman, go see it. Seriously, fantastic movie. Like in the movie, most people my age and younger have no idea what a teamster is or who the heck Jimmy Hoffa was. In a nutshell, he was president of the Teamster Union, which basically is just a union for truck drivers and transportation. And at the time, Mr. Jimmy Hoffa had a lot of uh, mafia connections. Jimmy Hoffa would loan money out to anyone considered to be a wise guy so they could develop the very mob controlled Las Vegas. 
With interest, of course. You never loan without interest. Scam of the century, really. Of course, Jimmy denied all claims even after serving time in the slammer for fraud. If that didn't make him look guilty, then mysteriously disappearing after 1975 sure did. Nobody knows exactly what happened to poor Jimmy, but one thing is for sure. He didn't just go for a walk and never come back. You know what I'm saying? Number 8. Roosevelt Younger folks might not know this name, but this is the only US president to serve more than two terms. Four terms, actually. Double, double trouble. A tradition put in place by George Washington when he declined his third term. Well, in 1940, this wasn't a law or written in the Constitution. More of just something that noble men honoring a tradition. Roosevelt ran for re-election and won, giving his good work on recovering from the Great Depression. Surely another global war would look good underneath him, right? Sure. Oh, and you know, they may have hid how sick he really was from polio. Yeah, the president had polio. Because you can't have a leader who looks weak, even though I'd argue if he did that, while he's having polio, that would make him look stronger than the average president, but yeah, what do I know? We'll go with that. He got elected again to see out World War II, however, he would pass away before he saw its end. And polio, man, that's a bad one, dude. That one cripples you up. That's not a good one, brother. That's a bad one. Oof. Number seven, Mrs. Meanie. Okay, this one's for me, all right? Or for all the people that had one teacher like this that used just to drive you insane. Naturally, I ain't gonna name names cause just because I ain't, but we'll call her Mrs. Meany. Mrs. Meany, for some reason, had it out for me back in school more than any other teacher that I knew. Yes, I was loud. I was the class clown. Strangely enough, I was voted for that in the yearbook. Is anyone surprised though? I'm, I'm not, no, not really. But this class, I was good. I swear I was. She constantly challenged me and would start arguments in the middle of class in front of all my friends. I didn't want to fight. I just wanted to get the day over with. What's scandalous, you may ask, about all this? Well, after talking to a few of my favorite teachers, they all said that Mrs. Meany was kind of mean to them too. See? I wasn't wrong. They never said anything as heinous about her as us kids did, but you know, my point stands. In a PG-13 rating, let me know if you guys had any teachers that you couldn't stand or just had it out for you in the comments below. I'm curious, I wanna know. No more mean teachers. Number six, Ray Kroc. The man, the myth, the legend. Every time it's 3 a.m. and you've been hitting the sauce the same way Conor McGregor hits a punching bag, you dig into some golden crisp fries, savory fresh nuggets, and a belly warming burger to coat your tequila lined stomach. Am I right? You can thank Ray Kroc for that. Who is that, you ask? Well, he's the founder of the McDonald's Corporation. Notice how I said the founder, not the creator or the owner. That's because while Ray Kroc was the CEO of the McDonald's Corporation, he was not its original owner and in a very hush-hush scandal, stole the company from underneath the original owners, the McDonald's brothers. Another great movie, The Founder, which again, I'm gonna recommend, it's, it's a really good movie. It explains a lot. It almost makes me feel kind of guilty to eat a delicious two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Or maybe not. Number five, Jordan Belfort. Steve Madden, Steve Madden. Oh, to be Jonah Hill struggling to make motor functions after throwing back too much donut sugar. You know what I mean? Maybe one day I'll get to be in the Scorsese movie. Call me, baby, I work cheap, come on. Despite my dreams of being an A-list movie star, the story behind that movie is what we're talking about, or rather the man in front of it all, Jordan Belfort. The Wolf of Wall Street, or rather just how I imagine every Wall Street guy is in a nutshell. Jordan Belfort was the leader of his own stockbroking company, who during the 90s would amass incalculable wealth due to many financial and stockbroking scams and schemes. This would fund a lifestyle that would make Ozzy Osbourne blush. Booze, substances that teachers would warn about you in school, and enough parties that would raise the fertility rates in whatever area they so happen to be in. Number four, parents. Tonight will be the night that I fall for you over again. Remember being 13? I know. Some of you are lucky that Facebook wasn't around when you were 13 because my generation now has archives of all the cringe things we used to post. Seriously, go back and look. It'll surprise you. That includes cringy song lyrics. However, when I think of rulers who are scandalous, sometimes I think of home. Not my home, but people in general. Now that we are all adults and we can all agree that our parents were right most of the time, but there's still a few times that they were wrong, weren't they? Mm-hmm, yeah, 100% wrong. I'm not upset. Who's upset, dude? I, dude, don't touch me, I'm fine, bro. I'm not upset. Mom, leave me alone. God, 
Number three, Napoleon Bonaparte, the Corsican Ogre. Napoleon's story is one of giving an inch and taking a mile, but sometimes the world runs out of miles to give everyone, and then things get a little chaotic, and, and that's just, you don't want that. Napoleon was given opportunities and he took them, which is something we should all do. When you get an opportunity, you should seize it. Carpe diem, right? What we shouldn't do, however, is invade Europe multiple times, and once we get the leg up, declare ourselves the first consul of France. Defeating the whole point of the previous revolution. It's kind of crazy, actually. Limiting the rights of his people and, in general, causing a lot of issues for, for everyone. Other European powers were afraid that he might kick their butt, which was very likely. He was a pretty good military leader. Or, even worse, give their people the idea of revolution. That's scary. However, after a cold winter in Russia and a bad trip to Waterloo, not Ontario, he was banished to an island where he wouldn't be able to bother anyone anymore. Au revoir, mon chéri. Number two, Joseph Stalin. Dude's down bad, maybe worse than a number one spot. The General Secretariat was not the original name for the leader of the USSR, but but when Joseph Jalin was in the position, well, he was quite literally the only one left standing. After all, his comrades and opponents took a nice vacation to a gulag. The title and name kind of had to change. A very bad man who had the mustache of Mario, but the heart of Al Capone. Not so nice. Helped the Allies in World War II, but kind of wasn't liberating as much as we were, as they were so much replacing the Germans as occupiers. Not, not, not very good. A man who had no love for his son, who was captured as a POW and kind of just let him not come back home. He, he was unalived. A man who probably still haunts Eastern Europe today. Thank goodness we moved past Soviet aggression, right? Number one, Mustache Man. Does he need an introduction? Another bad dude. Another bad mustache. Germany rose from the ashes of World War I to be a powerful nation. Just, you know, they did a lot of horrible, awful things to, to get there. And then Mustache Man plunged the whole world into the worst conflict the planet has ever seen, and a lot of people were unalived. On paper, and to the German people, he was just the bee's knees. But he had enough scandal to write books about. Of course, in that style of government, you can't write books about him that way. Or else you'd end up somewhere. Somewhere rotten. It wouldn't be very good for your health, bro. It wouldn't be good. I talked to the chief, who was a general. He looked at the battle plans and said, that's not it. In our number 10 spot, we have Irene of Athens. Starting off this list today, we are heading back to the Byzantine Empire. Irene of Athens was the mother of Constantine VI, and while the pair co-ruled together for almost two decades, things ended in quite the tragedy. After the pair co-ruled, Irene did go on to rule on her own from 797 to 802 CE, but you might be wondering how she managed to outrule her son. Well, Irene, the ambitious ruler, wanted full control all to herself, so she asked for the help of some political allies to pull off a scheme against her own son. She began to lead a conspiracy against him to try and get him out of power. The duo did end up reconciling their relationship, but this is not where the story ends. In 786, the public began to turn their backs on Constantine because he had decided to divorce his wife and instead marry his mistress. Irene saw this as a second chance and once again chose to conspire against her own son. Honestly, Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, this lady did not care. Here's where things in the story get exceptionally gory. Irene not only ordered the arrest of her son, but also ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Yep. That's how good old Mumsy came into power. In our number nine spot today, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was a Hungarian noblewoman who lived from August of 1560 to August of 1614. She was born into one of the oldest and most powerful families in Transylvania, and she was well educated and ran various estates and bore many children. Oh, and this is all happening while she was also killing young women and bathing in their blood. Yeah. Weird, gross, terrible. Elizabeth is known for killing her servants and bathing in their blood as she believed it would keep her young. Guess no one told her about moisturizing and minding your own business. All accounts of Elizabeth remember her as a terrible, evil person. It is said that her number of victims most likely ranges somewhere from 175 to 200, but some claim it might be as many as 600 people. It is no wonder she is referred to as Countess Dracula. In our number eight spot today, we have Olga of 
Upkeev. Olga Upkeev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed, and during the time her son was just too young to rule. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out using scalding hot water. Yeah, don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. She is the ultimate ride or die. It seems like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slaying, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from, she devised a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she was not okay. In our number 7 spot today, we have Wu Zetian. Throughout the long and storied history of China, there has only ever been one woman who held supreme power, and that is Empress Wu Zetian. Of course, considering this historic feat, she wanted to ensure that she kept her power by any means necessary. She had all of her rivals killed, so anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The Empress ordered the execution of the previous Empress, as well as members of her own family. She had multiple methods of taking these people out, and rumor has it that she even had her own grandmother and two of her grandchildren killed for going against her. It didn't matter who you were, if you threatened her power, you are done for. It is said that after a while, the Empress decided to do a little less killy killy and a little more lovey lovey. Yeah. Apparently, she started spending more time with her lovers using some aphrodisiacs. You know, we all are a little crazy when we're young, but as we get older, we all crave the simplicity and just someone to love, right? Of course, though people don't forget, and they were sure to exact their revenge. The people fought back and ended up having all of her lovers killed, and the empress herself was exiled. You know what they say about karma, she does not miss. In our number 6 spot today, we have Mary the First. Queen Mary the First didn't get the nickname Bloody Mary from nowhere. Oh no, this name was certainly earned. Mary was a Catholic queen in a Protestant country, which as you can imagine, was quite problematic when she ascended the throne of England in 1553. Although her reign only lasted 5 years, Years, she made a mark on history in a multitude of ways. She was the first true queen of England, and she was quite a vicious ruler. During her time as queen, Mary announced a war against Protestantism, which left many who belonged to the religion being charged with hearsay. Doesn't sound all that bad until you learn that at the time, the usual sentence for hearsay was to be burned at the stake. Nice. Mary was responsible for the burning of over 300 Protestants during her time as queen, which unsurprisingly left her quite unpopular. Popular. In our number 5 spot today, we have Caterina de' Medici. Caterina was an Italian noblewoman born into a famous family. She was Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, with marriage to King Henry II, and she was the mother of four future French kings. It wasn't exactly surprising news that her husband, Henry II, had a lifelong affair with a mistress, but on his deathbed, when he was begging to see his mistress, Caterina refused and left him to die a lonely and painful death. Do I entirely blame her? No, but it's also a pretty heartless move, you know what I mean? The daughter of the queen, Margaret, was said to be rebellious, but her mother wasn't just going to let her get away with it. The mother and daughter would fight over the married daughter's extramarital affairs, and it is said that Katerina's scream could be heard echoing throughout the palace. One fight between the two even saw her locking her daughter up in a castle, never to see her again. In our number 4 spot today, we have Agrippina the Younger. Roman Empress Julia Agrippina of Rome was pretty spoiled. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family, but that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, so she tricked her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing the Roman law so that they could get married. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died. Could be a really convenient coincidence. Or it could have been a totally planned hit. I'm not accusing anyone, 
I'm just telling you what the word on the street is. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually, Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had to force her out of power. Julia, as you could imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world she desired the most, and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow him, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. In our number 3 spot today we have Maria Eleonora. Maria of Brandenburg, the Queen of Sweden, has quite a horrifying story that relates to the birth of her daughter. Apparently, Maria wasn't feeling the overwhelming joy of childbirth because although she was hoping for a son, she gave birth to a daughter, Queen Christina. Maria wasn't shy about her opinion. She apparently screamed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Okay, it's kind of rude. She referred to her new child as a monster and apparently just absolutely did not want anything to do with Christina and would have rather that she just didn't exist. Apparently she even placed Christina to sleep next to the corpse of her father who had passed away. It's like a different kind of messed up. Things clearly weren't right with Maria. In our number 2 spot today we have Queen Isabella. Isabella co-ruled Spain from 1451 to 1504 with King Ferdinand II and during her reign she had some pretty horrific views and feelings. She wanted to get rid of all Spanish Muslims and Jewish people people from her kingdom. Sounds a bit like another evil ruler from history. In 1492, she ordered that all Jewish people either convert to Catholicism or get thrown out of the kingdom. She made them all come to Spanish court to either pledge their faith to Catholicism or get exiled from Spain. How horrible is that? The queen has also been attributed with establishing the Spanish Inquisition, which definitely is not a historical highlight. Both Isabella and Ferdinand are often said to have done great things for Spain, which in some cases is true, but at what cost? and for what reason? In her number one spot today we have Rana Valona the first. The last queen of Madagascar, she ruled the kingdom for 33 years from 1828 until 1861. There is no doubt that she was committed to her kingdom and that she would do anything for it, but in this plight she was cruel and violent. She initially came to power after the death of her husband and once she had it, she was not letting it go. The queen was able to keep away the advances of the French and British and she left the bodies of those who tried to attack out for display lay on the beach. In 1845, the queen ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months they were meant to have this massive buffalo hunt. Well, she clearly wasn't thinking everything through because 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion and uh, not one buffalo was hunted. Some records of history state that she even had her own uncle executed in order to protect her power. And there is an even more gruesome story. Some people even state that she ended her own mother's life by starving her to death. That is some epic level of evil, if it's true. Number 10, bears for pets. Okay, right off the bat, let's get crazy. Some of the hardest character deaths in Game of Thrones were definitely the dire wolves. Also, spoiler alert, but also you had eight years, so. Eh. Wolves as pets sounds like something Vikings would do for sure, but more often than not, they would just have dogs and cats just like us. Few of these animals were kept as pets, really. They all had a Viking purpose. They all had the big, cats probably had a big beard too, most likely. Viking cats belonged in the house to chase away rodents, just like they do today. Freya, the goddess of love in Norse mythology, rides in a cart that's being pulled by two cats. The cutest little cart ever. These cats were Egyptian. Most of the cats in Scandinavia came from Egypt at that time, and they adapted to a much colder climate. Viking dogs were also a thing. They were often found in graves next to human remains. So the man's best friend thing goes way back. They were hunting dogs and herding dogs. And they too followed their masters to Valhalla. Hence why the bones would always be found together after death. Here's the crazy part though. Vikings would also domesticate bears from cubhood. Yeah, they would have Viking bears as pets. What a fun way to kick this list off. Number nine. Norse paganism. If you're a fan of the MCU, this, uh, this guy Thor here with the cape and the hammer and the big muscles, odds are you've heard of him before Nick Fury introduced you. Thor and Odin, they come from Norse mythology. The Aesir are the main gods of the pantheon. Those include Thor, Odin, and even Loki. And yes, in Norse mythology, they lived on Asgard. It's not just MCU stuff one of the nine realms. So they believed that if they fought hard enough and lived the most fierce warrior lives they could, they would end up in the halls of Valhalla to join Odin in the fires of Ragnarok, the most fierce battle of all. The Vikings didn't have a name for their religion at first, so when they eventually ran into Christianity, they called it the Old Way. 
which just sounds cool. It's like, ah, yes, the old way. It's referred to today as the Asatro. That's the worship of Norse gods. That term became popular in the 19th century. So it came much later. There was a Nordic religion society in Denmark that had around 600 members, and that was back in 1997, so pretty recently. And it was approved officially in 2003. Believers now can mostly be found throughout Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland. Number eight, horned helmets. Okay, when you think of Vikings, you probably imagine a very large man in a big ass beard with some horns. You got a horn to blow on, a horn to drink wine out of or something, or some ale, and then two horns here on your helmet. Just the horniest fella. Well, aside from looking cool, they would have. Well, aside from looking cool, this horned helmet would have served absolutely no purpose to a warrior in combat. I don't know, unless there's a guy out there just headbutting all of his opponents individually, I don't know. The horned helmets were only introduced into Norse culture when costume designer Carl Emil Doppler made them for Norse themed operas in the 19th century. So it's really just modern art that we're thinking of. Also, Thor surely doesn't help. He has like wings on his helmet. I'm like, is that real or is that just Chris Hemsworth? I can't tell the difference. Number seven, hockey. I had to share this one, you know, being a Canadian and all, this one hurt. We found out that hockey wasn't our thing during Canada's 150th celebration. How epic is that? Oops, timing. I'm cold a lot of the time. My face hurts here in Canada. It hurts when I walk to the store and get my weird bagged milk and then I return back to my igloo. You know how it is. That's the idea, right? That Canadians are cold and they play hockey all the time. Well, honestly, yeah, pretty much. Not too far off. Well, hockey isn't just our favorite winter activity. Vikings loved it too. They actually brought it here in the first place, believe it or not. They didn't call it hockey also. They called it a way better name. They called it slap and fatten, which means to slap the fat around. You slap some fat with a stick. Me and the boys are gonna go around and do some road slap and fatten. <laughs> Car, heads up, pause the slap and fatten. Let's get out of here. Vikings would get sticks and try and slap some fat in between two posts. Imagine getting cross-checked by a Viking. See you later, chest plate. Number six, what's that smell? You would think that just looking at a Viking that they would probably smell bad. I don't know, they're by the sea a lot, they're always damp, there's lots of hair. I mean, the beards alone probably suck up 1% of the ocean. Barnacles and all that jazz. But believe it or not, these Vikings didn't smell bad. They were actually known for their hygiene. When excavations were done and all these sites that Vikings lived at, well, rather raided and then lived at, ancient hygiene tools were found. So like tweezers, combs, ear cleaners, they were into it. They weren't lucky enough to have Q-tips back then, so instead they used animal bones, which wouldn't hurt too much. Your eyes wouldn't really roll for that one, I don't think. It's just business, no pleasure. Vikings would bathe once a week, which to us sounds like a risky move, but once a week for that time period, that's amazing, that's unheard of. Queen Elizabeth I would only bathe once a month. So put that in comparison. Mind you, when you're hauling gear throughout a forest and then you have to use your ax for four hours straight, you might sweat a little bit more than the queen. Number five, the first raid. The first official Viking raid took place in 793 AD. These Viking raiders left such a huge mark on history that we refer to this time period as an age. Just like the Middle Ages, we have the Viking Age. It officially lasted from 793 to 1066, the year of the last big Viking battle. I said I'll get into that later on. I didn't, I just talked about hockey and slap fatten. Departing from agrarian pagan Scandinavia, settlers and traders rolled up to England and they arrived in Lidensfarn, and then from then on they just invaded hundreds of settlements. Now English kings were ruling over coastal areas at the time and they needed to start making defense plans from all these seagoing pagans that everybody's now talking about. Imagine hearing about pirate vikings, I'd be like, what, who are these, they have what, beards and axes? Number four, Viking funerals. Now, I know this isn't messed up per se, but I really wish that we still did Viking funerals. They would be way more fun. I don't know, instead of carrying that 900 pound casket down that aisle for like 14 city blocks, Vikings would do it in one of two ways, and both were pretty epic to witness, I'm sure. One way, they would bury the body, the classic, right? They would leave stone circles around the shallow graves that they dug, or do these burial mounds, or grave fields, usually after a battle. Vikings were pagan, they believed that the more smoke there was during a cremation, the better. The smoke was their way of reaching the afterlife. Boats also symbolized safe passageway to the afterlife in Norse mythology, so Vikings would shape these stones around the grave like a ship or a boat. But high-ranking Norsemen, they would be buried with their boats. In 834 AD, the Osberg ship burial honored two women, and this ship vessel was massive. It was 70 feet long and 17 feet wide, had 15 oars on each side. It was discovered in Norway on a farm, so the whole shooting an arrow while they're at sea thing, that sadly wasn't common. It wasn't a thing at all, really. Because if you missed, you just gave away the Osberg and you botched the funeral. Way to go. I know, sorry, I know. Number three, hit the slopes. 
Vikings didn't invent skiing by any means, but they did make it cooler. The name skiing actually comes from an old Norse term that means to stride on skis, and Viking would hunt on these skis. They got so good at hunting down elk on these skis that a law had to be written in order to protect them from going extinct. That's how good they got. The Gulathing Law of 1274, it was written in Norway, and it outlaws the hunting of elk while on skis. You probably read that and you're like, who the, what? Skiing was such a big advancement for Vikings that there's two Norse gods involved in the sport. We have Ullr, the god of snow, and Skadi. Imagine these two showing up in the next Thor movie. Game over, man, take my money. Number two, rap battles. I'm currently in the middle of Netflix Rhythm and Flow series. It's a great time, I'm loving it. It's like American Idol, but for rap. Like, hi, that's amazing. Rap battles today are nuts. They're crazy, they're intimate. Rap battles today are so impressive, but imagine getting schooled by a Viking yeah, you heard me. Imagine a Viking battling you and then just destroying everything that you care about after destroying you with words. You got a twofer. During those olden days, you needed a way to pass time. If you couldn't play hockey or slap fatten, and there weren't any villages to destroy, you always had poetry. Fighting comes from the Old Norse term flyta, which means provocation. Insult exchange, but make it theater. Norse literature really has tales of their gods fighting. Imagine the next season of Loki and he's battling Freya. I'm like, come on, he's got this. It's hometown advantage. It wasn't to see who can diss the other's hometown the hardest, really, per se. This is actually a challenge in order to see who can spontaneously think of a poetic retort. In Anglo-Saxon England, flighting would go down during a great feast, enjoying roast while watching a roast. We love it. This was entertainment in the 15th and 16th century Scotland. Now we have, well, this. We just have me ranting about flighting. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. I'm doing my best. And finally, number one, go berserk. Whenever you're playing a video game, or like Assassin's Creed Valhalla per se, that health bar at the top starts to glow and you're ready. For a brief second, you can go beast mode, and then everyone can hit you with arrows and nothing happens. Right? You go berserk. Most games have this in some way, but did you know berserkers were a real thing in history? Just like Thor and Loki and everything else, apparently? Those Norse warriors would arrive to the battle decked out in bearskins. The term means to change form. So these guys were considered a higher power when it came to these battles. So you gotta call in the big dogs, or as they were described back then, mad dogs. They could take an opponent down with just one hit, and today, we have an idea of what may have helped the fight. The odds that the guys were on something, be it mushrooms, maybe they were hammered, are pretty high. Pun intended. Number 10 in our countdown is Julia Get a Grip Agrippina. When the Emperor Claudius' wife, Melissiana, became entangled in an adultery scandal, the power position of the Roman Empress was suddenly wide open in the year 49. Julia Agrippina, exiled for a conspiracy against her first husband and widowed from her second that she was believed to have poisoned, concocted a scheme. In an outrageous maneuver, she seduced her own uncle Claudius to become his fourth wife. She didn't stop there, however. She then had her uncle husband make the son she had had in her prior marriage, Nero, his heir, by marrying him to his own daughter from his previous marriage. Ooh, now, that's, that's quite a family tree. Taking the title Augusta, she maintained a stronghold over political and household affairs, considering herself a co-ruler to her husband. After Claudius died from eating poisoned food, which is how her prior husband died, so make the connection there, Nero became a Roman emperor and would forever change Roman history in his time of rule. However, Agrippina could only hover above her son for so long, and his annoyance of her invasiveness grew. Nero chose to assassinate his mother with a trap, a boat set forth on the Bay of Naples designed to sink. But when it did, she swam ashore. Nero changed his plans and had his soldiers invade her summer home to do the deed instead. Number 9 in our countdown may be one of our most badass queens, Empress Theodora, from street busker to top dog. Syrian born Theodora starts her journey as an actress, dancer, and mime alongside her two sisters in the late 400s, something she abandons by age 16 to be a mistress to a Syrian official, and she travels much of North Africa with him before his maltreatment and temper made her settle down in Egypt alone, where she took up wool spinning. It was here she met Emperor Justinian and the two fell in love, and after Justinian changed some laws so that they could marry, they began co-ruling the Bayezidine Empire together. So what made her mad, you may ask? Her ideals and the smearing that they led to through history. She was historically known for supporting religious freedoms, women's rights, and the education of the masses. Her decisions, which reflected her opinions, led to the Nicaea riots of Constantinople. She intervened and was able to persuade her husband to stay. The two successfully quelled the revolt 
and in turn, she made Constantinople one of the most sophisticated cities in the world and promoted women's equity. Theodora's name appears in almost all the legislation passed during the period and she received foreign envoys and correspondence with foreign rulers. Her husband died in 1527 AD and Theodora took sole control of the Roman Empire. Under her reign, bridges, aqueducts and churches were built. Theodora died of cancer on June 28, 548 AD. She and Justinian are both considered saints by the Eastern Orthodox Church. The She-Wolf of France is in number 8 of our countdown. Her actual name is Queen Isabella of England and she was famously married to the closeted Edward II. Acting as a beard to someone who doesn't love you would be hard enough, but the two did also have to produce heirs together. One would be the future King Edward III. Queen Isabella was in a desolate and lonely situation, especially as her husband's two male suitors, Piers Gaveston, who he gifted her jewels to, and Hugh Dispenser, who was a wildly hated extortionist, were always his preferred company. So she rounded up some spiteful nobles, first killing Gaveston by beheading, and then driving Dispenser from the country and redistributing his wealth. King Edward unsurprisingly was upset and sieged against those who had contributed to the death and exile of his lovers, all whilst his wife took cover in the Tower of London. It's here she met exiled British traitor Lord Roger Mortimer and started her own affair. She had him broken out and sent to France where she later joined him and with her son and then sent Edward a letter that essentially said, suck it. The anger at having been cast aside turned into burning desire for vengeance as Isabella invaded England with her new husband and army and upsurped the throne where she and Mortimer then ruled until her son came of age and had her dethroned for her violent tendencies. She died 28 years later in retirement and Edward III later went on to rule England for 50 remarkable years. Maria the Mad comes in at number 7 of our countdown. She was just 16 years old when she became the Princess of Brazil and the Duchess of Bruxana, then their queen following the passing of her father. Brazil changed from just a Portuguese colony to a large kingdom. Brazil, the Algraves and the United Kingdom of Portugal are three famous formations recorded under Maria the Mad and her son. After the death of the queen's husband slash uncle in 1780, however, there was a noticeable decline in her mental health. 1788 saw the passing of her daughter, newborn son and her closest confidant. By 1792, after the passing of her eldest son a year prior, Maria seemed to be experiencing a combined symptoms of hallucinations, depression and anxiety all resulting from mass traumatic losses. It evolved to later include religious mania and melancholia. She started avoiding court gatherings and social or royal obligations. It was then her treatment went to Dr. Francis Willis, who tried straitjacketing, blistering, and ice baths, none of which were helpful for obvious reasons. After treatment for more than five years, he declared the disease was incurable. By 1792, Maria was no longer a capable ruler and deemed insane. Courts pushed her son John to take over the government ruling, but he delayed until he finally took the throne in 1799 for a truly tragic reason. There was just no longer any possibility that his mother would ever recover her senses. If the nickname Maria the Mad wasn't already taken, then this next Maria named Monarch would have snatched it up. In at number six is Maria Eleonora of Bradenburg. Maria Eleonora was born in 1599 to Prince of Bradenburg and Anna, Duchess of Prussia. She grew up pampered and Maria Eleonora was the it girl of the 17th century. All powerful monarchs fell over themselves to marry her. While she was dismissive of the 22 year old Swedish King Gustav Adolphus initially, in 1620 she changed her tune as she had apparently fallen in love with him practically overnight. And so they were married. With the king so frequently risking his life in battle, it became imperative that his wife produce a male heir. So Maria had to hanker down and focus on the baby making business. Maria experienced three stillborn children consecutively before the successful birth of her daughter in 1626. It was a rare break in battle, so her husband was there to excitedly greet his daughter. Maria, however, had a very different response. Her baby was born with the condition fleece lanugo, a condition where hair covers the body of a newborn. Her infant was enveloped from its head to its knees, leaving only its face, arms, and lower legs visible. Maria was horrified, claiming to have birthed a demon, and rejected her daughter for the decade to come, even after losing her husband in 1632 Battle of Lutz. And while everyone mourns their own way, it's easy to say Maria really took it up a notch. She forced their daughter to sleep in blacked out rooms and reportedly hung King Gustav's heart in a golden casket on the ceiling above the bed, making the girl sleep directly under her father's blessed remains. In 1633, Maria Eleonora returned to Sweden with her beloved's embalmed body. She refused to bury Gustav for more than a year, reportedly embracing and caressing the decomposing
Stephen King. Maria's story continues to become more demented with time and her daughter grows to become her caretaker, especially when troublesome Maria runs away to Denmark permanently and her daughter's left to become the queen and pay her mom's allowance to Danish royals. Awkward. Number 5 may have not gone mad, but it was her favorite emotion, Empress Anna of Russia. She is remembered as a horrible and spiteful child with a cruelty streak. Young Anna it was reported to be mannerless and vulgar. So when her father, who experienced a stroke shortly after her birth that left him handicapped, passed away, her very traditional mother attempted to raise her in classic elements of strict religious femininity, so she may be a quiet and obedient woman. Anna had other plans. She hunted animals, kept guns and swords, and terrorized other children as well as the commoners. This behavior was all a massive red flag for some of the crazy things she'd do later in life when granted power and the means. Anna's only husband ever was Frederick Williams, who at the reception indulged a little too heavy on alcohol and gave him a hangover so wicked that three days later he just died. In 1730, her uncle Peter the Great passed. The Privy Council turned her into the Empress of all of Russia since she was widowed and childless, which was assumed to cause less trouble. The joke's on them because she turned around and immediately abolished the Supreme Privy Council and re-established the autocracy. Now she had the sole power, and while she made some serious political waves, Anna also made some strange choices. She has a serious vendetta with Peter the Great's daughter Elizabeth, her cousin. Elizabeth was a better looking, younger, and also a rival for her throne. So she ruined her life. No nobleman could marry Elizabeth. If Elizabeth chose a commoner, the empress would strip her of her titles and her claim to the throne. When Anna found out about Elizabeth's side piece, the unhinged empress ordered her men to cut out his tongue and exiled him to Serbia. Anna even woke up one morning and decided to force Prince Mikhail to marry her lower class older maid as a joke. After the ceremony wrapped up, Anna placed the prince, Mikhail, and the maid in a cage, dressed them as clowns, and paraded them on top of an elephant to an ice palace she had constructed for their honeymoon. In the extreme cold of Russia, she reportedly advised them to get to doing the dirty with each other if they wanted to keep their bodies warm enough to stay alive. Maria Eleonora wasn't the only queen who couldn't give up on a dead relationship, pun intended. Number 4 is Joanna of Castile. Never meant to be a princess, let alone a queen, Joanna earned her title and nickname Joanna La Loca through unfortunate means. She had two older siblings, Isabella who passed in 1498 and Joan in 1497. Joanna's mother, the formidable Catholic monarch Isabella I of Castile, passed away in 1504. This left the throne to, of Castile and Lyon to Joanna when her father passed in 1517. Joanna had started exhibiting signs of mental instability in 1504 when her mother had been sick. She was struggling to eat or sleep and having outbursts of anger. One such example was when she wished to go see her husband in Flanders. The journey would take her through France, which Castile were at war with at the time. When she was prevented from leading for Flanders, 24 year old Joanna flew into a rage. Perhaps one of Joanna's most notable displays of mental instability occurred when her husband died in 1506. Joanna refused to part with her deceased husband's remains for a disturbingly long time, reportedly opening the casket to kiss or embrace him. I'm seeing a pattern here with some of these women. While pregnant, Joanna traveled with her husband's body from Burgos to Granada, a distance of 668 kilometers, which would take around six and a half hours to drive in a car today. And talk about a romantic imbalance, while she did all of this post humorously, when her husband Philip was alive, he talked Joanna's madness to anyone that would listen and completely discredited the woman. In 1509, Joanna was placed in the royal monastery slash covenant of Santa Clara and Tostillas, Castile, by her son Charles, who also forbade Joanna to have any visitors until her passing. The most recognizable name on our list is Marie Antoinette, who is number three in our countdown. Married at only 14, Marie was known to have lived an opulent lifestyle, but there was a lot of conspiracy and debate about the young woman. She was performing what she knew her royal duties to be, and she was known for not always being the most educated. She started the trend of riding donkeys and the worldwide trend of feathered slash stuffed bird hats. She even once had an entire miniature village created with functioning shops so that she and other elites may dress like commoners and experience living lower status. Marie was misguided and young, but she was also the victim of an incredible smear campaign. She was accused of having ulterior motives constantly, supplying the Austrians with military plans or siphoning millions of livres of treasury money to Austria. It was the tales of sexual deviance that were the most damaging though. Alleged to have had orgies, laid with commoners, or even have sex with her own ladies in waiting. Her most offensive accusal was thrown at her in trial before her famous decapitation where she was accused of committing indiscretions with her own child Louis 
Louise Charles. With such a vast array of accusations against her, not one of which was supported by any concrete evidence, the trial was a formality, conceived merely as a step towards completing the revolution. Marie Antoinette was declared guilty and executed only hours later at the age of 37. Speaking of sexual deviants, meet Queen Anna Nzinga who is number 2 in our countdown. Queen of what's now known as present day Angola, Anna took the crown when her brother passed away. Being queen of Angola was hard work, Anna managed to keep the Portuguese invaders out for over 40 years alone. So how would you, a tough and titanous queen, decompress? Why by building a harem of course! Anna collected the men she found to be the most attractive warriors in her region, keeping a harem of 50 to 60 men close at hand for whenever she, well, wanted a romp in the sack. Spending a great deal of her time strategizing around battlefield in men's apparel, some historians wonder if that's why she required the men in her harem to dress as women. Now Anna didn't have time to deal with picking who she was going to sleep with every night, so she devised a unique system. Anna would just have the two men who desired her the most that evening fight to the death every night and then bed the winner. The next day, the winner still loses as she would have them executed. Anna disbanded her harem at 75 when she took on her teenage husband, cementing her status as not only a serious badass who liberated her people and established dominance in an era of men, but also as a cougar. The next queen fought her way to the top of the countdown. Number one is Queen Rananavola the first. During her reign of Madagascar, Queen Rananavola the first is remembered as a dangerous tyrant who ruled her island nation with cruelty and an iron fist. Rananavola was a merciless to those who tried to colonize her nation, but also to those inhabiting it. Should crimes, disputes, or discourse arise, Rananavola had a nifty trick to solve it called trial by ordeal. Both parties would be forced to ingest three pieces of chicken skin alongside a poison taken from a native plant, Tangana. Throw up your chicken skins and you're proclaimed innocent, hooray! If you didn't, you were guilty and be put to death, if the poison didn't kill you first. This trial was one of the punishments used in her persecution of Christian colonists, alongside throwing people into rock quarries and live dismemberments, her horrific list really will go on. Rana Lavona was such a deadly tyrant that the queen managed to reduce her country's population from 5 million people in 1833 to 2.5 million in 1839, all through means of war, executions, religious persecution, or just settling scores. Depicted as a deranged tyrant even after her death in 1861, many have tried to repaint her image as one of a driven ruler trying to keep her culture and country independent from those trying to grow their own selfish empires. In at number 10 is Ludwig II. Ludwig operated as the King of Bavaria from 1845 to 1886. He was an opera fan, builder of dream palaces, spendthrift, deposed monarch, and likely the victim of a coup. So Ludwig was an enthusiastic consumer of art, so when he was appointed to the throne at just 18, he exploits his status for entertainment. He funds his hero, the composer Richard Wagner, on some of the era's most renowned operas. He also built Neuschwanstein, I can't say it properly to save my life, but it's a fairy tale palace on a hilltop. All this lavish expenditure was causing more and more debt in the empire and so higher taxes. It caused in 1886 conspirators to file a false medical document declaring Ludwig insane and unfit to rule. He may have spent an insane amount of money, but he himself wasn't. So irregardless, that next morning Ludwig and his personal physician are found floating dead in a Bavarian lake with no indication as to what had happened to him. One of Ludwig's most famous statements had been, I wish to remain an internal enigma to myself and others. Well. Goal achieved. Number nine is Henry V. Can't talk crazy without bringing up this guy. He's famous for his rinse and repeat style of having wives. As you may know, first he gets a wife, then he gets tired of her and is annoyed she can't have his male heir. So he obtains a side piece. So now you get rid of the initial wife, usually through de and then marry the side piece. Repeat. He did this numerous times. Henry also slept with just about anyone he could find, including his second wife's sister. And he may have fathered two of her kids. Ugh. And Henry is recorded to have a minimum of 12 mistresses outside his six wives, but there is potential for more. When Henry takes up wife number one's lady in waiting, Anne Boleyn, he had actually subverted the entire religion that they were a part of in order to divorce his initial wife, Catherine, and marry this mistress, effectively establishing a new church in which he became the head and changing the course of history. The huge scandal came not so much from that, but because in 1536 Anne was accused of adultery with five men, one of her own brother, and plotting the king's assassination, which was a sensational news story at the time. Number eight is the Christian the Fourth of Denmark. Even when he first took the throne in 1766, people were already convinced he was crazy. This brat threw food at dinner guests and picked fights, but rich people can be real jerks, so it wasn't until at some point when Christian discovered a newfound interest in his 
that he became an official write off. This guy became so obsessed with the flicking of the wrist that it interrupted his royal duties. In fact, his court confronted him with the concern that it was affecting his health and could potentially make him infertile or insane. In an 18th century version of stop that or you'll go blind. Thankfully, he didn't do it in front of visiting dignitaries at first. Instead, he just did other weird stuff like leapfrog to them or slap them without warning or push them over. He'd randomly yelp or holler in the middle of a conversation. Eventually, the court's concern grew true and Christian was so nuts that his personal physician managed to talk him into handing over the control of executive decision making to himself, also while banging Christian's wife in the background. Christian wanted to keep that appendage to himself, so I guess somebody else had to do the job for him. Or both of them, I guess. Number seven is a mouthful, Nibashid Nazar II. One of the greatest Babylonian kings who I'll be calling Neb for my own sake, won battles against Egypt and Assyrians in his quest to make Babylonia the most powerful city state. He gained control of trade and Mesopotamia from Syrian and Palestinians. He was powerful and tactical, and for seven years, he wandered open fields convinced he was an ox. This tale of insanity is documented in the Bible. According to Daniel 4.25, Neb had a disturbing dream in which his interpreter told him it meant, you will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched in the dew of the heavens. This prophecy fulfilled itself 12 months later when Neb fled from civilization suddenly. It's quoted he began eating grass like an ox. He became wet from dew. His hair grew long like feathers of an eagle and his nails grew long like claws of a bird. Then at the end of that time, which was seven years as mentioned, he says, I am Neb, but Neb, Neb, well, I'm Neb. I looked up toward the heaven and I was right in my mind again. Ironically, there's actually a medical term for this. Boanthropy is a psychological disorder where a sufferer believes they are a cow or ox. So I guess this happened enough times for a term. Number six is a wacky dude, Ibrahim of the Ottoman Empire. Ibrahim's scandals are more ridiculous than empire crumbling. He was known for a deep, passionate love of plus size women. Not in a I like them thick kind of way, but Ibrahim's juices started flowing for obese women. So this sultan had his agents track down the largest woman in the entire Ottoman Empire, said to have weighed about 280 to 300 pounds. The sultan was so delighted by her, he gave her a high government salary and the title of governor of Damascus. Also the cute nickname Seke Pere, which translated means a piece of sugar. Ibrahim wasn't even fully right in his mind before taking the throne. In the Ottoman Empire, it was normal for sultans to slaughter their entire family to ensure there are no corruption or attempts for the throne. Ibrahim's older brother actually let him live because he seemed so mentally ill, even as a prepubescent to ever even be a threat to the throne. Which, by the way, Ibrahim only ever got because his brother died prematurely without heirs. So after drowning 280 concubines for having another man touch them and feeding tons of gold coins to fish in his palace pool and some other weird stuff, his reign was cut short when a coup led by the Ottoman's highest religious leader as well as a six son had him strangled. Number five is the Zengde Emperor of China. He is remembered as a notorious leader of the Ming Dynasty for both his wild behavior and his cruelty. His biggest scandal surrounded the poor decision to leave senior Enoch Liu Jin in charge of the state's affairs. This causes unseemly taxes and poverty and unnecessary acts of aggression, things the general public, you know, tend to hate. The two finally fell out after two years and Liu was sentenced to slow slicing, a particularly graphic drawn out torturous death I don't recommend you look into without a strong stomach. Oh, and on top of that, he would waste the resources of his kingdom to play pretend. He would take the faux role of a general and went on raiding parties that were all dressed in silk. He even invented an imaginary best friend slash alter ego named Zhu Shu. To the exasperation of the Chinese government, he actually made them address this imaginary friend or watched as he ordered it on pointless raiding missions. Ironically, it's rumored sometimes he'd even put on a wig to represent his own alter ego and have the courts address him as Zhu Shu. Eventually, Zengde, the emperor, unexpectedly dies at the age of 29, shortly after he drunkenly fell off of a boat and contracted some fatal disease in the Yellow River. Number four, we can't talk scandal without Caligula. The emperor of Rome, he was born in 12 AD and lived to 41 AD. Caligula spent his time on the throne building lavish projects, exercising his sadism and brutality, and exhibiting eccentric behavior at any chance. Also cheating, so much cheating on his wife. Well, wives, four wives. Caligula sucked at settling down and his proclivity for both 
both genders apparently made it no easier. He was known to seduce senators wives right in front of them, bring home working girls, and engage in affairs with theater acts, specifically a dude named Menster. He also happened to love banging his sister. These did not win him public favor. Caligula is said to have banned the mention of goats in his presence due to his hairy appearance, and also practiced facial contortions to make himself be terrifying to his subjects. He was obsessed with his horse, building an entire castle, and attempting to appoint the steed to the high office of consul. And he once even had his army construct a two mile floating bridge just so it could gallop along it. After five years of this, his own army kills him. His unforgivable mistake was to jeopardize Rome's military reputation by declaring a sort of surreal war on the sea, ordering his soldiers to wade in, slash at the waves with their swords and spears, and carry chests full of seashells away as spoils of a victory over the god Neptune. Number three is Emperor Jiajing of China. He's actually the cousin of the previously mentioned Zengde Emperor, a family that scandals together stays together. And man, did this guy have some ideas. From dabbling in Taoism, he became obsessed with the legendary elixir of immortality and believed that collecting the menstrual blood of female virgins and using it to make a substance called red lead would give him powers that would enable him to live forever. Over 20 of these poor concubines were held directly for this purpose, as well as for his explorations. They were only fed mulberry leaves and rainwater to keep them pure and faced harsh living situations. In 1542, 16 of these concubines emotionally broke and planned a coup. They were seconds from success had one of the conspirators not panicked and backed out, running to snitch to the empress. The emperor was unconscious for over 24 hours, and so the empress decided to deal out the punishments on her own and gave the 16 girls the terrible death sentence of slow slicing. Also, their family members beheaded and others taken into forced servitude. One of the concubines she'd sentenced, however, was the emperor's favorite. So when a fire broke out a couple of years later in their temple, he actually let his wife perish in order she not be saved. Apparently, she'd always been too old for his perverted taste. The emperor died in 1567 at the age of 59. It's been widely speculated he succumbed to the toxic mercury contained in the elixirs of immortality that he had been ingesting over his lifetime. Number two is Charles III. He ruled from the time he was 12 in 1380 to his death in 1422, whilst under the 100 year war of England was at its peak. Naturally, this is a horrible time to have someone dubbed Charles the Mad on the throne. In 1392, he shows his first red flags of instability when he suddenly turns on his own knights during a manhunt and starts attacking his own advisor. It took several knights to subdue him and carry him back to the castle. It's all downhill from there. While they had assumed it was stress that caused that outburst, in the following years, it would prove otherwise. He began to forget people's names and roles, including his own. He would forget where he was, even like he was king. Maybe this was because he spent so much time running around the castle on all fours, pretending to be a wolf and howling at people. By the time Charles was convinced he was made of glass and banned people from touching him lest he break, well, his family had written him off. But now they were multiple sides vying for that throne. So during the Hundred Year War, civil war breaks out in the French monarchy between Charles's brother and cousin. This allowed England and other countries an immense upper hand in invasions, and so by the time Charles dies, much of France was occupied by foreign powers. And number one is Emperor Rudolf II. This guy was a known disaster. He was elected as the Holy Roman Empire in 1576 when he was already experiencing deep depression and mania. He also immediately tore up the religious settlement that for the past 20 years had kept Germany's Catholics and Protestants away from each other. Ending all peace, he embarked on a crusade to eradicate Protestantism from Germany's towns and villages, restarting an unnecessary war that had already been finished. Protestants' response was fast and strong. A self-defense league, alongside Hungarians rising in revolt and Turkish also taking an offensive. <sighs> Rudolf ran his up to Prague Castle and hid, refusing to speak to anyone. This scandal has the Habsburgs replace Rudolf with his brother Matthias, who undoes all the damage by restoring religious peace to Germany and signing treaties with the Turkish and Hungarians. Rudolf has a tantrum over this and starts the Turkish war again. So the Bohemians appeal to Matthias again for help, and in 1611, Rudolf was forced to hand power over to his brother once and for all. He died a year later, only after laying the foundation for the disastrous 30 years of war that would tear Europe apart within six Six years of his death. Number 10, Irene of Athens. First off, it's safe to say that all these people were a little spoiled. Like the royal family times a thousand. When you're named after cities, you were like rich, rich. Irene of Athens was Byzantine's empress to Emperor Leo IV and co ruler from 792 until 797, mother to son Constantine VI, and sole ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire. Yeah, that's quite a resume, Irene. The quote, untimely death. Okay of her husband caused the throne to fall to her. 
Interesting. Although when Irene's son Constantine was a teen, several revolts tried to make him sole ruler. Mom caught on in 797, and Irene gouged out both of her son's eyes and imprisoned him, dying shortly after. Talk about grounded, dude. Mom's in that unconditional love, huh? A revolt years later overthrew Irene and exiled her to a remote island where Irene died months later. History's dark, huh? She's like, I'm gonna count to three, and then I'm gonna rip out your eyes. One? Two. Number nine, Valeria Messalina. Turning the clocks back to 17, you know, the year 17, just 17 AD, a classic. That in 2016, solid years. Metaphorically and literally, ancient Romans paved the way for following civilizations. They achieved some groundbreaking stuff in their time, but the empress of the Romans at that time, from 17 AD to 48 AD, Valeria Messalina, well, she was too focused on a more lavish business rather than ruling over armies at that time. Many accounts in history can confirm this. Pliny the Elder wrote about it as well, so you know it's the real deal. Valeria, she owned a big fancy house where ladies of the evening would come and go. She made a lot of money. This is where the finest ladies who weren't even involved in that kind of lifestyle or that kind of business, this is where they changed their minds. Know what I mean? It was a big deal. She was changing the game. Because of Valeria and the operation she was running, sometimes Valeria herself would participate in these games. Yeah, contests, if I may, to see who could tango with the most people in one night. Yeah, Valeria hit 25 in one night, so yeah, I'd say she ruined a few parties for sure. I mean, her husband, Emperor Claudius, would at least agree. No? Number eight, Catherine de Medici. Catherine de Medici was an Italian noblewoman born into a famous, famous family. She was Queen of France from 1547 to 1559 with marriage to King Henry II and mother of four future French kings, France II, Charles IX, Henry III. The years during which all her sons reigned have been called the age of Catherine de Medici, as she has extensive influence in politics in France at the time. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, she raised those boys. She was like the secret hand making all the decisions, but she was cool and subtle. She's basically the Kris Jenner of her time. She married Henry, second son of King Francis, and after the king took part in some friendly jousting, he was smashed in the face and the splinters took his life days later. Ouch. Catherine then and her frail 15-year-old son were king and queen. When he died, she took power again till her 10-year-old son was ready. After that, he died. Same thing for the third son. The age expectancy was abysmal back then. She ruled with her youngest until her illness in her late 40s. Hmm. Number seven, Queen Rana Valona the first, the last queen of Madagascar. Where to begin? Queen Rana Valona, one of the worst in history. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was cruel, violent, and would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with power. It's pretty sad. In the late 1700s, the king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him, as everywhere that happens. And the king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. Okay. The king repaid said local by adopting his daughter, his daughter being Rana Valona. And now she was set to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Valona the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized, of course, that she, you know, poisoned him, so that's probable and horrible. Rana Valona kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Yeah, just to give you an idea of how she handled things. Yuck. Number six, Bloody Mary. England's first female monarch, Mary I, ruled for just five years. The only surviving child of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. Mary took the throne after the brief reign of her half-brother. They say she was an evil queen, but after doing my homework, yeah, I'd have some chips on my shoulders as well. Married at nine and 11? Everyone's just yelling at you because you're too young to have kids? Yeah, that's awful. She was promoted and demoted so many times, no wonder she did what she did. Every time she was close to the throne, all of a sudden her family tree was just like rearranged by law. Her dad decided to go down the other family route. Nice, nice. She's infamously remembered for burning 300 English Protestants at the stake, which earned her the nickname Bloody Mary. Her brother found a loophole with religion, so she was like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, light him up. She's also famously remembered as teaming up with her half-sister, Elizabeth I, and ruling together as sisters, making them the first two British queens. She was spoiled from birth, but she's kind of a badass. Anyone that did her harm, past or present, they were either sent to the tower or the chopping block. 
checkmate. Number five, Empress Agrippina. Continuing on from 48 AD, the next leading lady in charge of ancient Rome was Julia Agrippina. And right off the bat, she was already spoiled. Yeah, she lived a lavish life. Her husband was the emperor, of course she did. She had a family, but still, that somehow all wasn't enough for Empress Agrippina. And she wanted more. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors, of course, as one would. She believed that her and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, so she lied her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law just so they could get married. Yeah, love it. Gotta change the rules, I guess. We can do that? Okay. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, suddenly, just out of the blue, huh, oh no, Claudius passed away. Crazy. Most people think Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. The empress and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so she could, you know, hold on to that little bit of power. But eventually Nero got tired of his mom talking over his shoulders. He's like, you know what? No, you go to your room. How does that sound? Nero then had her forced out of said power. And Julia, as you could imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world she desired the most. And so she rallied a group of supporters to try and, you know, overthrow throw the power, but plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Yeah, I'm watching a lot of Survivor right now. In Survivor, we call that a blind side, Jeff. Here we go. I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ptolemy, I had to. Number four, Diane de Poitiers. Diane de Poitiers was a French noblewoman. She held power and influence as King Henry II's royal mistress and advisor until his death. And at the tender age of 15, Diane was married to Louise de Brez, the much, much older and grandson to the King of France. They had two daughters, Francois and Louise. After his death, she took interest in another very powerful man, her childhood crush, friend, and the new king. Uh oh. Henry married to Catherine de Medici. Wait, like that, Catherine? Yeah. Oh yeah, talk about a bizarre love triangle of power. After he got clocked in the face and died in a jousting accident like I said before, Diane adopted the habit of wearing black and white for the rest of her life. Queen Catherine de Medici soon assumed control though, restricting her access to the royal chambers from Henry's deathbed and not even allowing her at the royal funeral. I mean, she's a married woman. Wives and their husbands mistresses. Copying her style, stealing her man and her crown. She was exiled, comfortably. Like early, early rich retirement, spoiled. What do you think? Number three, Princess Margaret. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret, I have to mention, she partied with rock stars during the 60s, okay? I'm not gonna leave her out of this list. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this badass, I guess, in the media, whatever. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Yeah, Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry the princess. How fun is that? Also, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming, that was a wake up call. Guess my whole life's a lie. Sick. Hit that thumbs up button if you also agree that Pablo's more recent. Insane. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV, okay? She was a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. Now, in 1968, word had spread that the princess had an affair with nightclub pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who just a year and a half later sadly took his own life. And then come 1973, paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. Ooh la la. Ooh, big zoom on that one. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated. Yeah, she had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. Yeah, how dare her decide what she wants to do with her body post-death. Uh. Number two, Cleopatra. Talk about spoiled. Cleopatra Philopater was queen of the kingdom of Egypt from 51 to 30 BC and its last active ruler. From both Roman and Egyptian blood, Cleopatra accompanied her father, Ptolemy XII, into exile to Rome. But after a revolt in Egypt, his rival daughter, Berenice, claimed his throne. Ooh, siblings, am I right? What are you looking at? Berenice was killed in 55 BC when Ptolemy, her, and Cleopatra's brother returned to Egypt with a Roman military and took revenge. Yeah, more siblings. When dad died, the reign of Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy 13 was born and short-lived because arch nemesis Julius Caesar and him kind of hated each other. And yet, another war. Cleopatra sided with her brother's foe this time. Yeah, lots of switching sides back and forth, huh? Not a lot of loyalty in these families. I don't know. Eventually she cheated on him with Mark Antony, resulting in yet another war. After Antony was defeated, it led her love to take his own life out of shame and guilt. When Cleopatra found out about this, 
She poisoned herself following him into the afterlife. Yeah, that's loyalty. That's true love. The OG Romeo and Juliet. Also, Shakespeare does a wonderful show around the affairs and power of these two. Eternity was in our lips and in our eyes. Antony, act one, scene one. That's beautiful. Beautiful, lovely. And number one, Clara Ward. Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up quite the conversation. She was famous, but you know, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal. That's it, the rest is history. Since birth though, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband in the first place, okay? She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. But she would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, make it look good, shake some hands, get some photos. Hey, yeah, nice button, awesome, see you later. She's involved, you know, she's part of the team. But then she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman, Kime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back with him said wife. People were freaking out at this point. A royal married a common American girl? This is unheard of. She was the talk of every town. See, unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off her newfound wealth. Some loved her in her image, others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician, and after her divorce, she turned to modeling. So yeah, it seems like she was in it for one reason. I don't know. I feel like she enjoyed the clout. Just a little bit, right? Just a bit. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Ivan the Fourth, more commonly known as Ivan the Terrible. He was the son of Vasily the Third, who is the Rurikid ruler of the Grand Duchy of Moscow. After his father's death, however, at just three years old, Ivan was named the Grand Prince, and by the time he was 16, he was declared as the Tsar or Emperor of Russia, officially establishing the Tsardom of Russia. Ivan and his reign are certainly known for the transformation of Russia from a medieval state to an empire, but not without a huge cost to the people of Russia, as well as a hit to the long term economy. Ivan has been described as being intelligent and devout, but also prone to paranoia, rage, and episodic outbreaks of mental instability that only increased the older he got. One of the main points of extreme violence and viciousness was the massacre of Novgorod, which saw the deaths of an estimated 2,000 to 15,000 people, as well as a shocking amount of acts of extreme, violent cruelty. In the later years, like I mentioned, his violent tendencies only got worse, which led to him doing things like striking his heir in the heat of an argument so badly that it left him with brain damage. In the end, Ivan the Terrible met his demise from a heart attack in 1584. Yeah, they say that impaling hundreds of people every day isn't great for the heart health. Someone should have let him know about vitamins and minerals, or maybe some good cardio heavy exercise. I don't know. In our number nine spot today, we have Leopold II. As the second king of the Belgians, Leopold has been said to be responsible for the deaths of somewhere between two to 15 million people. Yeah, million. It wasn't in Belgium that he committed his atrocious acts, however. It all started when he claimed himself to be the founder and sole owner of the Congo Free State, which was a private project he undertook on his own. Leopold loved colonialism. He wanted to colonize everything he possibly could, and this is why he started the International African Society, which he used to travel to Africa, claim land that obviously wasn't his, and we're not talking about a small piece. We're talking about land that is several times the size of Belgium, and many countries just let him do this and allowed him to freely rule this land. This is definitely already bad enough, but of course things only got worse. Leopold had his own private militia that he used to force the indigenous population into hard labor. While Leopold was doing this, of course for economic reasons, he also was just doing this because he was a messed up guy. He was terrible. He made those who lived here harvest and process rubber, and the punishments for those who didn't harvest enough for him were extremely severe. Not to mention, it also said that sometimes he would just inflict harm because he could. Eventually, a stop needed to be put to his wrongdoings, but of course he was going to do everything he could to hide some of the horrors he did. The entire archive of the Congo Free State was burned, and he told his aide that even though the Congo had been taken from him, quote, they have no right to know what I did there. The Congo was taken from him, but remained under the rule of Belgium in 1908 until the Congo was given independence in 1960. As for Leopold, well, he remained the ruler of Belgium until his death in 1909, but the secret was out now, and no one liked him. In fact, his funeral procession was booed by the crowd because everyone was angry at him for the things that he had done. In our number 8 spot today, we have Qin Shi Huang. While this leader is often credited with creating the first unified Chinese empire, the Qin Dynasty, these accomplishments didn't come cheap. When he came to power in 221 BCE, he strictly followed seven principles, which not only pushed for severe punishment, but also acted 
acted in contraries and issued unattainable orders. He also is said to have been extremely paranoid about the power of the educated, which led to him burning books so that no one could ever learn what was in them, and he also killed 460 Confucian scholars in just one year, which some claim was because they were unable to make him immortal? Huang wanted not only to establish a transport system, but also build a wall to keep out enemies, and this meant that he had to relocate at least 120,000 families. He declared that all would be equal under one law, and then taxed everyone heavily. And because of these heavy taxes, as well as the insane labor that was expected to create the wall and the transport system, thousands of people were overworked, starved, and perished. He also had laborers create a massive tomb for him, complete with 8,000 life-size terracotta warriors and horses, which you may be familiar with, because now it is rumored to be an extremely haunted place. I mean, an evil ruler's resting place? Yeah, of course it's haunted. In our number 7 spot today, we have Don Carlos. I'll be honest, this little troublemaker never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kind of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias during the mid-1500s, as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth, which many believe could be due to the inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviors, though, are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things like hurting or taking the lives of animals just for fun. I mean, nowadays we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then, they just chalked it up to boys being boys. It is even said that at one point, he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Red flags, they were abundant. Soon, of course, his cruelties would extend to humans, with people claiming that one time he chose to whip a servant girl for no reason other than because he could. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made the prince that he didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided there's no way in hell. Like, he was so bad, she would rather marry his dad, which she did in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement, where he passed away six months later. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him have Hacking up knights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was totally abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances bricked up. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number 5 spot today, we have Nero. For this one, we are going to be taking it all the way back to the age of the Roman Empire. When we think back to these times, they weren't necessarily the most kind, peaceful times. Times, but there certainly are some characters that stand out as being particularly brutal, and one of those is Nero. Throughout his reign, he wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire, he burned cities, he killed thousands of people, including every member of his own family, and I mean, we know the inventive execution methods of the past, so you can probably guess at just how brutal all of these were. Most Roman sources give us an almost completely negative review of him in reference to both his personality as well as his reign as a leader. He was called compulsive and corrupt, and it is believed that he is actually to blame for the great fire that burned Rome, but instead he used the Christians as a scapegoat so that they would receive punishments rather than him. In the end, after being declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and realizing that the rebellion would be lost, he ended up taking his own life at the age of 30. In our number 4 spot today, we have Pol Pot. Pol Pot was the leader of the Cambodian revolutionary group called the Khmer Rogue, and this group with him at the forefront went on to try and destroy the Cambodian civilization. This wasn't necessarily how the group started out, but once Paul and others who shared his ideals came to lead it, things quickly became very dark. He is likely one of the only people who ordered a mass genocide 
genocide in his own country. The reasoning behind all of this is because he believed that destroying the civilization was the best way to start a new regime and bring in a new age. He ended up serving as the prime minister from 1976 until 1979, during which his policies led to the deaths of around 2 million people, which is horrifying. That was about 25% of the entire population. He even liked to keep the skulls of those he had killed. Just gonna say, it seems as though politics was the mask for someone who just really wanted to kill people. There are so many horrific details surrounding him and the things he did, much of which I can't even repeat here on YouTube, and that is exactly how he landed a spot here on today's list. He truly did some horrendous things, and in the end, went on to live the rest of his life and died of natural causes before he could even answer for any of his crimes, which is just the most frustrating end to a horrible tale. In our number three spot today, we have Maximilien Robespierre. Okay, I'll be honest. This is quite a polarizing one. Maximilian, on one hand, was great. He advocated for universal suffrage, for unrestricted admission to national posts, and he was against racial and religious discrimination. Especially in the time he ruled in, this was huge. Of course people were against him, but in our modern views, he was way ahead of his time in these beliefs. On the other hand, however, he was extremely violent and was the leader during most of the French reign of terror that happened during the revolution. It is said that during this time, he was responsible for imprisoning somewhere around 300,000 and killing somewhere around 40,000. During the revolution in 1793, he was elected head of the Committee of Public Safety, and from that point on, any voice that was in opposition to the change that was happening was struck down and silenced by him. Throughout the years, his ego and power only grew, which led to him being a little too quick to use the guillotine, his favorite execution method. He was getting a little too cozy with that thing, so much so that he began to use it even on people who had, at one time, been his allies. We saw this clearly when it came to the execution of George Danton, who Maximilian had executed after he suggested maybe chilling out on the whole reign of terror thing. In the end, people caught on to this tendency for violence and horrible punishments, which definitely lost some of his public support, and this was only exacerbated when it was realized that he now had beliefs that directly contradicted those he had earlier, like when he tried to to create a national religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being. By the time 1794 came around, he was overthrown, and later that year, he found himself being executed by you guessed it, the guillotine. Not good, no thanks. In our number two spot today, we have Vlad Tepes. Often referred to as Vlad the Impaler, he was the ruler of Wallachia three times between 1448 until his death in 1476. He is often regarded as one of the most important rulers in Wallachian history, and to many he is a hero, and this is not to disregard that. But you don't get a nickname like the Impaler by being a passive, peaceful guy. Vlad was known for his brutality and his love of impaling people, but it is also said that everyone's favorite vampire, Dracula, was modeled after him. This is because it is rumored that Vlad liked to dip his bread in the blood of his enemies before eating it. I prefer a little olive oil and balsamic vinegar with mine, but hey, to each his own, I guess. Vlad is known for his intimidation tactics, which included having bodies of those he had killed lined up outside of the city so that any enemies approaching would know what fate they had coming. Like I mentioned before, many regard Vlad as a hero. I mean, it is abundantly clear that he fought as hard as he could to protect Romania and Bulgaria from the Ottomans, but that doesn't mean that the horrific things he did have been forgotten either. Vlad definitely left quite the legacy behind when he was killed in 1476. In our number one spot today, we have Joseph Stalin. Stalin was a Georgian revolutionary and Soviet political leader who governed the Soviet Union from 1922 until his death in 1953. Despite the fact that he started his time governing the country as a part of a collective leadership, by the 1930s, he had consolidated all of the power and went on to begin acting as the Soviet Union's dictator. During his reign, Stalin was responsible for the deaths of over 60 million people, 20 million of them being his own. Apparently, the math works out to about 40,000 people per week, which is just 
unbelievable. For almost 30 years, he reigned the Soviet Union with terror and violence. I mean, his decisions led to a famine that killed millions of people. Also, the lives he took weren't just of his enemies. I mean, how could one person have 60 million enemies? He would take the lives of families of people he liked. He just took too many lives, was too paranoid, and while he was powerful and smart, he could also be an absolute monster. This is all perfectly summed up when he said, quote, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is simply a statistic. Number 10, the young czar. Being the leader of a nation is hard. I play a lot of city builders, trust me, I know. Being the leader of a nation whose people have been brutally oppressed by your family's dynasty for 300 years and in general living in very poor conditions, especially compared to the rest of the world, that's hard too, even harder. Nicholas II inherited the throne from his father, which sounds great, but in reality was a lot of pressure to do so. As it turns out, Russia was in need of drastic change, and they would get it from the people and a bald man with very pointy facial hair. A communist revolution saw the empire of Russia fall. 300 years of Romanov rule end overnight, as the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. So what's his crime? Well, not doing anything. Negligence. He did so much nothing that people had to do something. Number 9, Nero Steam. We've talked about Emperor Nero quite a lot on this channel, but that's because he's the down bad Roman Emperor who puts opulence in Pax Romana. It's hard to pinpoint an exact crime or moment from him, as he's the guy you think about when you think of Roman Emperors. However, his crimes against his wife Claudia Octavia are very notable. So when Nero was getting remarried, he had to get rid of Octavia. I mean, you can't, you can't have like 40 wives, wait, that's we gotta get rid of her. But how? I mean, how do you get rid of a woman like that? He actually did the whole uh, James Bond villain thing where the victim gets placed into a trap. Uh, it's very crude, but theatrical, because remember, that theatrics are important. Remember that, folks. Hence, Octavia was banished to an island where shortly after she was locked into a vapor bath where she suffocated. Naturally, to make himself look better, uh, they made it look like uh, they made it look like she did it, not him. So yeah, what a great guy! What a what an absolute hero in that story. Definitely not a villain. Number eight, Abzal Khan. Everyone remembers King Henry VIII for doing what he did to his wives. A naughty slap on the wrist, naughty. Don't do that. For shame. However, I would like to offer Abzal Khan as the alternative monster here. He, he didn't unalive a handful of wives like Henry, no, no. He actually managed to rack up a count of 63. Yep, you heard me right, 63. First off, I don't know how you have that many wives and or remember names, let alone birthdays and anniversaries. I would not do very well in that situation. Well, what's the reason for all this blood spilling? It's pretty horrible, actually. Simply because he was being invaded, and the guy who was invading him and winning was slightly nicer to women and was going to most likely give them a better life. Jeez, talk about if I can't have it, no one can. God. Number seven, Caligula's wife. I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous, a promising athlete, or really enjoys building Legos. Nice tie fighter, babe, way to go. Yeah. Emperor Caligula of Rome liked to put his wife on a pedestal, literally. And while on this pedestal, she was wearing nothing but her birthday suit. Oh boy. Well, all of his friends, politicians, generals got to gawk and stare at her. And in some weird goth power flex, he would oftentimes hold a knife to her and tell her that he could just end her life whenever he wanted because he can do that. Not to mention the guy had a complete narcissist complex, building statues of himself everywhere just so she can, like, oh great, there he is again. It's him again. Number six, Kangas Khan. I bring the man up again because he's responsible for so much loss. So much blood spill, so much pain. Sure, they were effective warriors and archers, but they were, they were brutal, dude, especially him. They took what they wanted when they wanted, and it's said that he was responsible for so many lives lost that it affected the carbon footprint of the planet. Dude, that's insane. That is literally insane. Also, to note his treatment of rather, uh, well, mistreatment of women. YouTube won't let me say much, but I can tell you that these ladies were not inviting him into their bedrooms. It wasn't, uh, wasn't good. As it stands today, because of his bedroom misconduct, his DNA still lives on. 5% of men worldwide share his DNA. Number five, Pedro of Castile. 
Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with fellow kingdoms or the bigger kingdom itself, actually. Pedro of Castile married the young Blanche of Bourbon of France, and so Spain could just be a wee bit more snug you know, in case the English come over. You gotta be careful. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower, just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince was not coming to rescue this damsel in distress, uh, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe. You know what I'm talking about. As Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just, that's just awful, really. Imagine being locked up in a tower for so long. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, Chief. Do you think I get food delivery apps to work up in a tower? Because otherwise you have to let me out, dude. Comic Con's coming. Anime Convention North's coming, buddy. I gotta go. Gotta get, gotta get my Naruto on, bro. Come on, man. Number four, hands on funeral. This one's just gross. When you're in a relationship, it can provide you with some great things. Someone to go through life with. Companionship. Love. And if you're lucky, someone is a good cook or a baker. Oh, love me some baked goods. Mmm. However, also in a relationship, sometimes you do more than that. Sometimes you get a little close under the sheets, if you know what I'm saying. Take King Philip V, for example, who loved loving his wife so much that he, well, he just couldn't help himself, you know? Like, for instance, when his wife tragically passed away, he wanted one last, um, one last ride. But he penciled in one more trip to Toe Curl City before she was laid to rest. I, I just... God, that doesn't seem right, you know? That just let her, you know, let her, let her go peacefully, you know? Let her just, ah, f Number three, Lenin. Okay, while not a king in the most stereotypical sense, he did dethrone a king and made himself an autocratic dictator, which is basically a king just modern. Trust me, it is. It, yep, trust me. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, Lenin had been anti-royal for most of his life, but after some help from some sneaky Germans and other Soviets loyal to his cause, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate, like I said at the top of the list. He abolished the Tsar's secret police and then put in his own. Mm. And had people oppressed, which was one of the main reasons why the whole revolution started in the first place. See what I'm getting at? He was supposed to get rid of the evil monarch, and he became the evil monarch. Hmm. Well, see, then a civil war broke out, and then he was worried that the exiled Tsar might escape and try to retake the throne, and, well, he had some goons take care of him, and, uh, well, the family, too. You, you can never be too sure. You gotta take care of everything. You, know, you gotta get rid of everybody. You just can't be too sure. Number two. Pope John the 12th. For those who aren't very religious like myself, the Pope is the big one. He's next to God, and for a minute there, he was the most powerful man on earth. Seriously, I mean, th this guy could crown kings. He's the king of the Vatican, and the king of kings in the Holy Scripture. It's kind of serious. And today, he's got a really cool car for parades. The Pope is pretty sick, not gonna lie. However, Pope John the 12th was anything but a sweet old man who delivers the holy messages from God. This Pope was doing a lot of anti-Pope behavior, if you will. Now, I for one wouldn't care if the man had a girlfriend or a glass of wine. Heck, some rules need to be changed, but this Pope uh, was most known for his lavish, how you say, adult-themed parties, and was known for getting hangovers. It got so bad at one point, it started a war. Number one, not so slick shady. Marshall Mathers, Eminem, the king of rap and named king of hip hop by Rolling Stones magazine. Hence he's the king, I gotcha. Despite what you think of the man's lyrics, especially vulgarity, he's an excellent wordsmith and could write rhymes that would leave you tongue twisted. However, I don't think it would come to anyone's surprise that the man's got a few charges under his belt, especially the way he talks about Kim. There's a couple, a couple of bad things he said about her, I don't know. Back in 2001, arguably the peak of his career, Eminem assaulted somebody in a nightclub after getting fresh with his wife. He got two years probation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is saying the things he's saying in those songs. Maybe he's telling the truth. Hmm, I don't know. Number 10, King Charles I. You can put any king down on this list, really. Uh, people weren't as kind and loving as we are now. Or, or well... Less cruel, I guess. <laughs> King Charles was no different from any other. A monarch sniffing his own farts up in his castle, doing his very best to snuff out religious groups that he didn't agree with. A lot of guys were like that. It's brutal, but that's history, folks. Well, one such measure he took, I think, was so wrong, so heinous, and so criminal, and so offensive, that he should have been locked up for life. 
During the 1600s, this man, in an effort to curb religious views, outlawed Christmas. Yeah, that's right. Outlawed Christmas. That means no gifts, no tree, no Santa Claus, no turkey, no stuffing, no nothing. This was quickly dissolved after he was removed from office. And yes, I know Santa Claus wasn't there then, but st it's still, it's Santa Claus, it's Christmas. Can't have Christmas without Santa Claus. Number nine, William the Conqueror. You've all probably heard the name William the Conqueror. Battle of Hastings, illegitimate son of the king fighting for the throne, very violently too, I might add. However, today I want to talk about his dating skills. Look, dating can be hard. I, I, I get that. There's a lot of anxiety, especially when self-image comes into play. Ooh, I'm too fat. I hate my nose. And what are these legs? Ugh, no one's gonna like me. Everyone thinks like that. And it's always usually right before a date, too. You could be staring in the mirror, and then all of a sudden all your bruises, pimples, and blemishes seem to show up out of nowhere. It's weird how that works. Well, William was different though. He, he was more confident. He didn't have confidence issues like the rest of us. To quote a brilliant chemist, he was the one who knocks. As the story goes, he was quite fond of one lass. She was not fond of him. Classic story, really. So after trying to court her several times and failing, he decided to drag her on the ground by her hair until she said yes. Don't, don't do that, that's, that's bad. Number eight, Kangas Khan. I don't think some folks realize just how brutal this guy really was. I mean, if you've ever played the Ghost of Tsushima game on PlayStation, then you know exactly what the Mongol horde is capable of. Mossy things. The man carved out most of Asia and parts of Europe. In one battle allegedly taking the lives of one million people. And all that remained was a mountain of bones and human fat. Ooh, gross. He's been known on how not to treat a lady and reportedly liked to use his young and newest soldiers as arrow fodder by creating human shields with them. A lot of conscripts in his army were often taken from villages and he conquered. It's kind of how he kept the machine going. So either fight with me or that's picture app for you. What a nice guy. What a swell nice guy. Jeez. Number seven, Galizo Maria Saforza. This guy was just bad. Like, like all bad. Not like Deadpool where he does some bad stuff for good reasons, anti-hero kind of guy. This, nah, this guy's just straight bad, straight evil. In one story of the disturbed king, he had a rival's hands chopped off. No more tennis matches. He left prisoners in hanging cages and even had a priest that made a prediction about him that he didn't find all too flattering in prison with little food and water. It got to the point where the man had to eat his own refuse. So if you cross Galeazzo Maria Saforza, um, don't, don't do it. Number six, Ivan the Terrible. I'm not that familiar with Russian history before the year 1900, but there is a lot to unpack. It's not all Lenin and hammers and sickles and such. Ivan the Terrible was the first czar of Russia, and he was quite the specimen. From having struck his daughter-in-law and unlifing his son in a fit of rage, he was one nasty dude. However, I believe the story of him in St. Basil's Cathedral is more noteworthy. As the story goes, Ivan commissioned an architect to build St. Basil's Cathedral. If you've ever seen it, you know how gorgeous it is. All the Onion Palace buildings and whatnot, you know what I'm talking about. Ivan was so impressed with the architect's work that he had his eyes gouged out so that no one could ever build another structure or gaze upon another structure as magnificent as the cathedral. That's hardcore, dude. That's pretty hardcore. So if you do a bad job, he probably would have got rid of you. And if you do a good job, he'll still get rid of you. Number five, Ferdinand the First of Naples. This one is so strange, I I can't even, I, I have to mention, I, I cannot not say it. In a nutshell, Ferdinand looked normal, just your average European king. I mean, what, what could be wrong about this guy, right? He looks pretty normal. Well, the guy was basically Buffalo Bill. Ferdinand liked to keep his enemies close, taking after a little bit of Michael Corleone. However, so close that oftentimes dinner guests would mysteriously disappear and end up not breathing. Afterwards, they would be mummified and pickled and dressed as if they were still alive. He would then invite more guests over for dinner to show them what could happen if they crossed him. He would open the doors and show them a sick dinner-esque area play thing of people dressed up and that's mm, that's that's what bad people do that's what buffalo bill would do that's gross we don't like that number four henry the eighth are you even surprised he's on this list i mean come on it's henry the eighth 
but I, I support all healthy marriages and I support healthy divorces. Sometimes things just don't work out, but that doesn't mean you have to go all Johnny Depp on the situation. There's better ways to work things out. Well, in Henry's case, it may not be televised on national TV, or global TV in this case. It was more like Edward Scissorhands, if you will. Henry VIII is famous for dealing with his wives. When the church would not grant him the divorce he so wished for, he removed his wife's head from her body. And then he remarried and divorced another, and then he, uh, well, another one lost her head, and then divorced another, and then finally he passed away and the wife lived on. It makes sense, sure, that's, all I'm saying is the man went a little too far. That's all I'm saying, just a little bit. Number three, John King of England. This is the dude who wrote the Magna Carta, which for legal students everywhere is like planet Krypton. It's where it all starts. The whole Superman, the law, everything. It's the basis of everything. Besides Hammurabi's code, of course. Well, it's not like he signed it very enthusiastically, and the man really wasn't the nicest. He's also known for taking 22 of his most noble knights and throwing them away in a dungeon until they starved and didn't wake up for, well, no breakfast. He betrayed his brother, Richard the Lionheart, the very famous Richard the Lionheart, who also wasn't very nice either, and is suspected of being the mastermind behind the delifing of his nephew. Ooh, talk about family scandal. Number two, Napoleon Bonaparte. I know, hear me out though. The story of France and Napoleon is one for the history books. I mean, really, it's, it's so strange. Imagine a country that violently overthrows its king and queen, and then while in the middle of that, which could be described as the worst political strife in history, you then go to war, which, if you know how that, it's, it's not a good idea. You, 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 you're probably going to lose. Except Napoleon didn't lose. Napoleon took France to war like five times within a, a short time period and won most of them. It's pretty good. Well, good for winning, not good for the people that make it. That's when he declared himself Emperor of France and kind of lost his way, which it's stupid because it defeated the whole purpose and point of the revolution and the democracy that the people were so fighting for. Eventually the international community caught up with him and banned him to an island twice because he came back and said, I'm back. And then no, back to the island. Go, go back. You're going, you're going back. Number one, Elvis Presley. Look, I know, I know it's it's Elvis, but he's the king of rock and roll, man. You, you can't go wrong with Elvis. It, plus, it kind of works, too, because I think people have a really good image of him, but he actually wasn't... You'll see. He is the king of rock and roll, to be fair, and he's more famous than any king on this list, actually. But the king of rock and roll isn't so squeaky clean and certainly not a stranger to crime and scandal. At some points in his career, you could find him excessive drinking and using um, illicit substances, if you will. He might have had to put on those jailhouse rocking denims, well, for real. Back in 1956, at the peak of his fame, really, Elvis got into a physical altercation with two gas station attendants after fans began to crowd him. It was a messy situation, and he was actually up on charges of battery and disorderly conduct. Not a good look for the king, baby. The king's got to stay clean. 